with her hands covering her eyes. She's playing hide and seek, but with who? She lifts her hands from her eyes and says, Charlie, come out, come out wherever you are. Ready or not, here I come. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are doing super, super well. So picture this, you're nine years old and your mother just passed away. You're obviously going through such a difficult time. Your dad is doing his best to help you navigate this new life and be there for you emotionally. However, you're still struggling to deal with your emotions. So you create an imaginary friend named Charlie. Charlie is there to help you get through this difficult time. He's there to support you and he's there to be your friend. However, instead of things actually getting better with this new friendship with Charlie, things actually start to get worse. As soon as Charlie comes into your life, people around you start dying one by one. Your dad begins to question you, you know, because Charlie is just an imaginary friend. So who is actually committing all of these murders? Is it you, but you just don't even know it? Well, that is the topic of today's video. Today, we're going to be talking about the thriller slash mystery movie, Hide and Seek, starring Dakota Fanning and Robert De Niro. This is just such a good movie, you guys. It came out in 2005. And if you're looking for a Halloween movie to get you in the spooky mood, this is the one. It's suspenseful, it's mysterious, and the twist is so good. Like, I remember watching this back in the day, and I was like, no, like, there's no way that's a real twist because it's just so good, and it's like the last thing that you would expect. So as you guys know, I love taking a break from true crime every once in a while and just sitting down with you guys to talk about a fictional thriller, mystery, horror story. So since Halloween is right around the corner, it's now spooky season, I thought it would be fun if we sat down and talked about some of my favorite scary movies. So just sit back, relax, grab yourself a snack, get a glass of wine, and let's just sit back and let's talk some mystery. I'm also going to be baking for you guys, so have my little bacon baking supplies. I'm going to try to make these mummy brownies that I saw on Pinterest. I tried to make them last year. They were a complete fail. So we're going to try again. And I think it's going to be better because last time I made them from scratch and now we're making them from the box. So it's going to be fun. We're just going to make some spooky Halloween treats. I'm going to tell you guys a really good story and don't worry, there will still be a true crime video coming this week. So definitely stay tuned for that. But yeah, I think that's pretty much all I have to say. I hope you guys enjoy today's video and let's jump right in and let's talk about hide and seek. Okay, before we begin, let's start setting up these brownies. So we're going to be making some supreme chocolate chunk brownies. So we need one fourth cup of water, one third cup of vegetable oil, and one egg. So I brought all of this stuff down here with me, and then I have my frosting back there, which I'm so excited about. I hope the mummies actually turn out good, because I'm telling you, last year, they turned out terrible. I also have an egg in a cup. So let me start setting this up. We do some ASMR. Okay. Here we got the brownie mix. So first step first, stir in the brownie mix, the water, oil, and the egg in a medium bowl until well blended and then spread in a pan. Perfect, we can do this. So let's set the scene. It's the first day of the new year in New York City. It's a cold day and there are some faint screams of excitement and thrill that are heard while a little girl named Emily is being pushed around a merry-go-round. She's lying down. She's got this big smile on her face. She has a bright pink jacket on and with one hand, she's gripping the metal handle with her purple fuzzy glove. And with the other hand, she is holding a doll that has two red ribbons in her hair and one on her dress. She is admiring the bare tree branches above her while she's getting spun and is giggling of happiness as her mom, Allison, keeps spinning her faster and faster. The mom, Allison, is also giggling with her daughter and she just has the biggest smile on her face. We pan over to Emily's father, David, and he's walking up to them with warm hot dogs in his hand and some drinks that he bought at a food stand not too far from behind. Now, Allison doesn't see him approaching her, but he's just standing in the background watching Allison and Emily enjoy this time together, playing on the playground, and just being happy together. David just stops there, and he kind of just 
watches in awe seeing his wife and his daughter having such a good time and he just feels so grateful that he has such a beautiful and loving wife and a wonderful daughter. Later that day, inside the family home, a picture frame with a photo of the three of them is propped up and behind it, Allison is in the kitchen alone with a glass of wine and a bottle of pills. She's wearing this really fancy black dress. She looks all dolled up. She has her makeup done, her hair done, and she looks really pretty, but she doesn't look happy. Earlier, we saw her grinning and smiling at the playground with her daughter, but now she looked quite sad. She hesitantly takes a pill and gushes it down with the rest of the wine, and then she quickly rinses the glass, as if she doesn't want people to know that she just drank this glass of wine. She then walks over to Emily's room, and she kind of perks up before she enters the door. You know, she was feeling sad. It seemed like she didn't want to take these pills so before entering her daughter's bedroom she kind of perks up and just kind of gets ready to put on her mom face she enters emily's bedroom but she can't see her and she says out loud in a playful tone that's funny i could have sworn that i saw a little girl by the name of emily come in here she puts her hands on her hips and just kind of like walks around the room and says come out come out wherever you are she goes to emily's closet and she says could she be hiding in the closet and then she swiftly opens a door to try to surprise emily but she's not there she closes a closet door and says, I wonder where she could be, as she peeps her head inside Emily's bathroom, but Emily still isn't there. She ends up turning off the lights in the room and with a soft smile says, hmm, maybe my eyes have deceived me. And that's when Emily finally answers in a muffled voice and says, I'm invisible, mommy. And Allison looks at her bed and says, well, if you're invisible, then how could I do this? And she goes to tickle Emily, who is hiding under the covers, and they both laugh. Emily gets out from under the covers and asks while still laughing, Did you know I was there? And Allison says, Not a clue. Do you want Alex? And she hands her the doll that Emily was holding at the park. Allison places a doll next to Emily, and then Emily hugs it. Allison just suddenly changes her demeanor, and she gets kind of serious. Emily notices this because she was just laughing with her mother playing hide and seek and having a good time and she asked her what is it allison just kind of disregards it and in a very genuine tone says i love you more than anything else in the world you know that don't you emily responds i love you too and allison leans in to kiss her on the cheek and with teary eyes says good night emily giggles and says do the face, please. And then Allison makes this like funny puffy face where she like puffs up her cheeks and tucks her lower lip under her top lip and just like widens her eyes. They both laugh at this face and Allison turns off the light, takes one last look at her daughter Emily and closes the door. Mommy! And Allison says, sorry. And she leaves the door ajar to leave some light to still enter Emily's room. And then she takes one last look at her daughter again before finally walking away. Allison walks in to her and her husband's bedroom and goes to her dresser to take off her jewelry. She starts getting ready for bed and while she's doing this her husband David is looking through a telescope kind of just like looking out the window and is kind of quiet. Turns to his wife and says coming to bed. Allison answers him in kind of a snarky way and says in a little while David asks something you want to talk about and he says this with a really concerned look on his face. Allison just looks over at him and just lets out a big sigh and says some things are beyond therapy david and she walks away to the bathroom to take a bath she has a bunch of candles lit around her the lights are dim and she's lying in the bathtub filled with water and she's kind of just vacantly staring forward so you can tell that Something isn't right between David and Allison. Their marriage doesn't look as perfect as it does on all the photos that are placed throughout the house. Now, we cut to David, who is sleeping in bed, and he's snoring and he's in a deep sleep when he's suddenly woken up to the touch of a woman's hand caressing his face. And when he opens his eyes, he has an instant flashback to some kind of party with balloons, and it looks like it was some type of celebration, maybe a New Year's Eve party. And he has this flashback, and then he kind of just like gasps, 
and he looks at the clock next to him and sees that it's 2.06 in the morning. He turns over and realizes that his wife, Allison, never made it into bed. I mean, it doesn't even look like she got into bed at all because her side of the bed is still covered with their decorative pillows. So he sees that his wife is missing and then all of a sudden he hears the bathroom faucet dripping water. So he gets up and goes to see what's happening. He reaches the hallway that leads to the bathroom door and worriedly says, honey, but no response. He walks towards the door, unsure of what he'll see. He slowly goes into the bathroom and the bath doors are frosted so he can only see the flickering candle lights behind them. He opens the bath doors and sees his wife lifeless, lying in bright red water. His eyes widen with panic and he frantically steps in and grabs her. He wraps his arms around his wife and he just begins bawling. Unfortunately, behind David, we can see that Emily is standing there watching her dad hold her mother's body. She saw everything. Emily didn't dare to move and she just couldn't take her eyes off of what she was witnessing. Her father bawling as her mother lay in a pool of her blood. To Emily and David, it seems like Allison took her own life. Okay, we have the water, the oil, and the egg plus the mixture all mixed in. So now we're gonna get to mixing. And this is my favorite part. I love eating brownie batter, but I probably won't eat it right now because I'm not even kidding you guys. I have had the worst stomach pain today. Honestly, for the past week, like my stomach has been having these really weird cramps. I just feel like really bloated, like something is not right. So. I don't even know if I'm gonna eat a lot of this, but look at how good that looks. Does anyone else love brownie batter? I love just getting a spoon and eating it, even though I probably not good for you. Like it's probably not good to just eat raw brownie batter, but look at that. Oh, that looks so good. Should we just take a little lick? I'm like, let's just do a little lick. Mmm, 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 mmm. That would go, okay, one more lick, one more lick. That's it. That's all I'm having. Fast forward, Emily is at the New York City's Children's Hospital. She's in a room full of other children playing and talking, but she's alone, sitting in a chair in front of the windows, just looking out at them with a blank stare. She looks like she's still in shock and emotionless as to what she witnessed, which of course is totally understandable. I mean, imagine stumbling upon this scene at two o'clock in the morning, your dad just hugging your mother's lifeless body. Of course, it's traumatizing for anyone. Now, while Emily is sitting in the children's room just staring out the window, David is with a psychologist named Catherine, and they're looking into the children's room from behind a glass, and he honestly seems stressed. I should have seen this coming, he says with a frown on his face. All the signs were there. Catherine replies and says, the ones closest to you are the hardest to judge. No, but I, I could have prevented it. David, this is not your fault. How long have we known each other? Trust me when I tell you this, as difficult as it may seem, you're gonna have to try and start over. David agrees and says, we're gonna move upstate to the country. Catherine seems a little bit disappointed with this and says, that's not exactly what I meant by starting over. What about Emily? This is a traumatic time for her. I think it's important that she stays here and works through this. No, here she's flooded with memories. I need to expose her to a new environment, new things to do. Catherine cuts him off and says, but she'd be losing another person that she depends on if you move away, referring to herself. It's only an hour away and you're always welcome to come and see her and right now I need to do what's best for Emily. I need to be a full-time dad. The next scene shows them loading up their car with suitcases and with their pet cat. Before they leave, Catherine tells Emily that she has a surprise for her and she hands her a jewelry box and when Emily opens it, a melody begins to play and a ballerina spins. When I was your age, my mom gave me one just like that and whenever I was feeling sad, I would open the lid and all my sorrows would go away. After hearing this, Emily kind of smiles back at her and she just looks down at the box. Catherine asks her, do you like it? Emily doesn't reply. They hug each other tightly and she tells her, you're going to like it there. Emily just stares back at her without saying anything. Catherine closes the car door and she waves goodbye as she sees David and Emily driving away to their new home. Now, the drive to their new home in the country is through roads that honestly seem like it's in the middle of nowhere. The roads are very curvy and they're going up mountains and it just seems like they're going to an area that's very secluded, very different than where they were living in New York. 
Emily is in the back seat, staring at the trees without leaves as they pass, and her cat yawns from its cage beside her. They finally arrive at their new home in Woodland, New York, which only has a population of 2,200 people. It seems like a very small town, maybe not that much to do, but it also looks very cozy, and maybe this will be a good environment for Emily. You know, a fresh start where she doesn't know anybody, nobody knows her mom, and they can just have a new life there. So they arrive and they park their car in front of this very large house. I mean, honestly, it looks like a mansion, definitely way more space than what two people need. So they pull up to this house and they're greeted by two men. The first man is holding a red folder and he goes to shake David's hand and says, right on time. David shakes his hand back and says, Mr. Haskins, nice to meet you. Now, Mr. Haskins points at the man behind him who is in a police uniform and his name is Sheriff Hafferty. And he says that he He's a sheriff that routinely checks up on the homes in this area just to make sure that everything is going well. David greets Sheriff Hafferty and says, I see, well, this is my daughter, Emily. Emily? This is Sheriff Hafferty. And the sheriff goes to shake Emily's hand and he leans down to ask her how she's doing. Emily doesn't reply to him. She kind of just stares. And then, and then David introduces her to Mr. Haskins. This is Mr. Haskins. He helped us find the home, says David. And now Mr. Haskins leans down and says, well, hello there, Emily. Do you think your dad did a good job at picking the house? And again, Emily just doesn't respond. She just stares blankly at him. David tries to cut the awkwardness and says, she still hasn't decided. Well, she sure is pretty, says Mr. Haskins. He goes on to explain to David how the town is pretty much a summer vacation home for lots of folks. So it can get really quiet there and it can kind of get lonely. Like this isn't a town where people live there 24 seven. So he's gonna be pretty secluded up there. And right now it's currently the fall time. So it's gonna be a minute before summer comes along and they get to meet some of their neighbors and just other people in the community. Mr. Haskins goes to let them in through the back of the house. And as they're walking, the sheriff asks David, have you ever spent much time in the country? Not much. I used to camp when I was little, but I was always scared of the woods. The sheriff chuckles and says, nothing to be scared of in these woods. You picked a nice spot. Biggest house on the lake. Mr. Haskins asks the sheriff to do the honors of letting David into his new home. And as he's searching for the keys on his keychain, David looks around and he notices that Emily is gone. Did you see where my daughter went? And Mr. Haskins and Sheriff Hafferty say, no. So the three of them go to the front of the house to where the car is parked and they're looking for Emily. They're shouting her name. Emily, Emily, Emily until finally David sees her down the hill with her back facing him. She's not moving or looking around. She's just standing there looking forward off into the distance. David runs over to her and says, honey, are you okay? And again, Emily ignores his questions. She's staring at this arch made of tree branches and it honestly looks man-made, not something that nature would do on its own. Come on, come on, David says, and they walk back up to the house together. It's now nighttime, and David and Emily are having dinner. David is drinking a glass of wine, and Emily has her doll sitting next to her. They have these bowls of spaghetti in front of them, and David is eating, he's enjoying his food, but Emily isn't eating any, and she's kind of just like playing around with it. Spaghetti and meatballs is your favorite dish. You're not hungry? And Emily just stares blankly back at him without saying anything. Now, we haven't really heard Emily say any words since she was saying goodnight to her mom the night she died. She honestly just looks really distraught and she even has these bags under her eyes and a bunch of discoloration. So you can just tell that Emily has been having a difficult time sleeping and just getting over this. David tries to cheer his daughter up by making the silly face that her mom would do where she would like puff up her cheeks and just act all goofy. But Emily doesn't laugh or smile or do anything anything. All she says is, I'd like to go to bed now. And David just looks at her get up and walk away with defeat. He's now left to finish his dinner alone with only the sounds of owls hooting outside. Honestly, as the viewer, you kind of feel for David. You know, he just lost his wife in such a sudden and unexpected way and also in such a graphic way. I mean, imagine stumbling upon your wife's body like that and having to raise a child all on your own now, having to move away from everything 
everything you've ever known and having problems connecting with your child. You know, it seems like David is doing his best to be there for Emily and make her happy and make her feel like she's still loved, but Emily just doesn't want to open up. In Emily's room, the new jewelry box that Catherine gave her is open, playing the lullaby Mockingbird. David walks into the room and there's two brass twin beds in the room. The lights are off and Emily isn't in either one of the beds. So in a playful tone, David says, oh, that's funny. I could have sworn I saw a little girl by the name of Emily come in here. And he begins wandering around the room. I wonder where she could be hiding. Could she be under the bed? As he swiftly lifts up the bed sheets that hang over the bed and peeks his head under. No, could she be hiding? Let's see, where could she be hiding? Could she be hiding in the closet? And he quickly opens it up, trying to surprise Emily. Instead of Emily being there, he's actually startled by the cat that just runs out meowing. At this point, Emily enters from behind him and turns on the light. She isn't laughing and she sees what David is trying to do. You know, he's trying to play hide and seek like her and her mom would play and he's trying to cheer her up, but it's just not working for her. She's not laughing and she kind of looks annoyed at her dad and she just walks past him, goes into bed, hugs her doll and just starts getting ready to go to sleep. David walks up to her and he sits on the side of the bed and he hands Emily a diary. He thought it would be a good idea for her to write in it every day so that she can look back on it later in life and see how much she's changed. Again, Emily doesn't reply and she kind of just looks away from him. David tells her, I love you more than anything in the world. You know that. And when David says this, Emily finally speaks up. That's what mommy said. David is confused and says, hmm? What are you talking about? Before she killed herself, that's what mommy said. David looks at her sad and says that her mom did mean that and so does he. He gets up, kisses her on the forehead, turns off the lights and he leaves the door ajar just like her mom would. I had to go get a spatula, but I think it's time to pour the brownies into the pan. Let's see, how are we gonna do this? Oh my God, I am so tempted to eat this, you guys. It's like actually not funny, like what I wanna do to these brownies. So. Pause from the story. Let's set up these brownies. Look at this. Brownies are laid out in their pan. I'm gonna go put this in the oven for like 35, 40 minutes, and then we're gonna get to decorating. So the next morning, David begins to unpack some boxes in his new office. He hangs up this plaque in his office that he has from the Society of New York Psychologists, which lets us know that that's his profession. And through the window behind him, we can see that Emily is outside wearing a red coat, holding her doll in one hand and walking down the hill towards the arch made of tree branches she saw the day before. The leaves beneath her are crunching and as she looks up, she sees a monarch butterfly and she chases after it. It leads her to a cave made of piled rocks and she stops and stares as she watches the butterfly enter the cave. Back inside, David is writing a report on how Emily is doing, but he stops midway as he realizes the ink has leaked from his pen onto his hand. He gets up, you know, to clean off his hand and he also starts looking around for Emily, but he doesn't find her. Emily, Em, Emily, he shouts and he is startled as he turns around and sees that Emily is standing right there behind him. There you are. We have to go into town to run some errands. Let's go. She walks towards him, leaving a trail of mud behind her. As they're about to leave, David opens the front door and sees a woman standing there holding a basket. Hi there, I'm Laura. I live next door. And she hands him a basket that's filled with homemade jams. Now, David is caught by surprise and says, oh, I didn't realize anyone else lived up here. Yeah, it does get pretty quiet in the off season. And David introduces Emily to Laura and Emily just stays quiet and doesn't even say hi back to Laura. Laura looks at Emily and then looks back at David and says, it'll be a real treat having both of you here. If you need anything, don't hesitate to stop by. And then she walks away and takes one last look back at Emily. So one of their errands for the day was to stop at a gas station to fill their car up. A train passes by in the background and in front of the gas station, there's a small pond with the play set. A little girl is on the swing and a woman is sitting at a nearby picnic table reading a magazine. The 
The woman yells at the little girl, I'm going to tell your mom. Would you listen to me? David overhears this conversation and he heads over to where the woman and the little girl are, leaving Emily in the backseat of the car by herself. He approaches a woman and says, hi. I have a daughter the same age. She's actually in the car and she shakes the woman's hand. The girl replies and says, Hi, I'm Elizabeth, Elizabeth Young. Are you here visiting? No, I just moved from the city. Wow, usually it's the other way around. She chuckles. Emily is still in the car watching her dad and this new woman have this conversation and she begins to wipe the car window with her hand because it's a little bit foggy. David asks Elizabeth, is she your kid? Motioning to the little girl. Oh no, she's my sister's kid. And the little girl, Amy, yells for Elizabeth to watch her hang upside down from the monkey bars. But when Elizabeth turns around, Amy actually falls to the ground. Now, while everyone is like freaking out at the fact that Amy just fell from the monkey bars, we can see that Emily is grinning in the car is she happy that the little girl almost injured herself or why does she seem so happy at this emily and david continue their errands in town and then they finally come back home for the night david is tucking emily into bed and he realizes that her doll is gone where's your doll i don't like her anymore says emily did i just hear what i think i heard you don't like your doll are you mad? David says, no, I'm not mad. And Emily just replies and says, okay, good. I have a new friend now. Mm, let me guess. Um, is it? And David starts to name all the other dolls in her room. Emily cuts him off and says, it's not a doll. Okay, well, who's your new friend then? And Emily just looks down. She kind of fidgets with her blanket and says, he doesn't want me to talk about him. David looks really confused at this and says, well, what if I promise to keep it a secret? Will you tell me then? Emily nods and David tells her, what's his name? He wants me to call him Charlie. When did you meet Charlie? Today. David is still confused by this. I mean, they were together all day long. They went to have breakfast. They went into town. They spoke with Elizabeth and with Amy. David tells her, did you meet him when we were in town? No, I met him before that. Okay, is he here right now? David asks as he's looking around the room. With a smile on her face, Emily says, I think he's sleeping. So now Emily has an imaginary friend. After this conversation, David calls the other psychologist, Catherine, the one that we met earlier, and he explains to her what just happened, how Emily now has an imaginary friend, a guy named Charlie. Catherine tries to reassure David and tells him, you know, it's not unusual for a traumatized kid to create imaginary friends. David acknowledges it and says, I know, but I just wish she would confide in me and not in fantasies. David, just have fun with her, play with her. That's what she needs, says Catherine, and they hang up the phone. After their phone call, David goes outside to take the trash to the bin, and when he opens the trash bin, he sees Emily's doll with her face smashed lying inside. Disturbed by this, David looks around with suspicion, kind of just like, who did this? Like, who smashed my daughter's doll? And then he just puts the doll back in the trash and goes back in the house. Was it Emily? Did she destroy her dolls? But why? The next day, David goes into town to buy two fishing rods, and while he's waiting to get checked out, he sees through the shop window Sheriff Hafferty, the one that we met earlier when they first moved in, placing a ticket on the windshield. David quickly finishes paying for his items and he walks back to the car. He grabs the ticket and he shouts after the sheriff who is about to get back in his car and drive away. The sheriff turns around and says, you parked in a handicap zone. David kind of just like looks around trying to see the handicap sign and he drops his shoulders and says, I didn't realize it. Can you give me a break? I didn't realize it was handicapped. But the sheriff just shrugs at him and says, have a good day, and walks back to his car. Wow, so much for small town hospitality, David says to Emily sarcastically. Emily responds and says, we broke the law. Now, with their new fishing rods, they arrive at a lake and they choose a spot to settle down. David sets up his portable chair, opens a book, looks through some kind of fishing manual, and begins to unpack everything that they just bought. He looks up and sees a beetle in Emily's hand, and he waits to see what Emily is doing with this beetle. And Emily all of a sudden just grabs the fishing hook and stabs the beetle's belly. David cringes at this. Like, he's kind of surprised. Like, what is my daughter doing? Like, I thought she was just going to play with this beetle. I didn't know she was going to stab it. So he's confused by this, and he says, is that a good idea, Emily? We already have bait, but she just ignores him and shows him a close-up of the beetle. 
back at home. They're eating dinner and David asks Emily, did you have a nice time today? It was okay. Well, what could we have done to make it better? What if Charlie was there? Would he make it better? Charlie's a lot of fun, Emily says with a smile on her face as she plays with her food. How is he fun? Well, he's fun like mommy. They finish dinner and David goes to tuck Emily into bed, but before doing so, he realizes that the room is quite stuffy. So he goes to one of her bedroom windows and tries to open it to kind of let in a breeze, but no matter how hard he tries to lift the window open, he can't. He pounds on the latch and he keeps trying and trying, but still, the window just won't open so he finally decides to give up and go to bed while david is sleeping he has another flashback this time it's the same party scene that we saw earlier you know the one with the balloons and it looks like some type of celebration is going on well we see a flashback of the party and then we also see a flashback of the bathroom hallway from the house where his wife died in he is dreaming this but then all of a sudden he just wakes up to the touch of a woman caressing him just like he did the night his wife wife died. David turns over to the clock and realizes that it's 2.06 in the morning and he hears the bathroom faucet dripping. This just kind of takes him back to the night that his wife died. Remember, he woke up that morning at 2.06 a.m. and he heard the bathroom faucet dripping. So, he kind of just takes a deep breath. He kind of tries to calm down, but he ends up getting up to see what is happening. Again, this is just very eerie. All of this stuff happened the night his wife died, so he's just really confused. So David gets up, he walks to the hallway, and he sees that the hallway bathroom is dimly lit. He gets really suspicious, and he approaches the bathroom slowly. He sees the same thing he saw the night his wife died. This time, instead of a frosted glass shower doors, it's only a curtain. He can see flickering candles behind it, and when he opens a curtain, he sees that the bathtub is filled with water, and that something is written on the shower walls in a red and very creepy font. The writing says, you let her die. David turns around in a panic, and he just sees Emily standing at the door, staring at him with her eyes peeled. Emily, why would you do this? Why would you write that? He tries to remain calm, but obviously, like, this is a terrible thing that someone wrote. I mean... His wife's death was not his fault. His wife took her own life. I didn't do it, says Emily, very frustrated. What do you mean you didn't do it? There's nobody here but us. Emily shakes her head and just tells her dad that it wasn't her. David clearly doesn't believe her because it was written with her handwriting and with crayons. It's all right. Just tell me. You don't have to lie to me. Just tell me the truth. I'm not lying, insists Emily. Okay, if you didn't do it, then who did? It was Charlie says Emily with a frightened look on her face. David looks at her like, really? Like Charlie, your imaginary friend did this? But instead of continuing to hound his daughter, he just gives up trying to get the truth out of her. The next day, David is venting to Catherine over the phone. She thinks I'm responsible for Allison's death, he sighs. It's Charlie's fault, says Catherine. Use him to get through to her. He's the key. David hangs up the phone because he sees that a car is approaching. And when he looks out the window, he sees that it's the woman the little girl that he met at the park the other day. So he goes to open the front door for them and they both look super happy to be there. They have these big smiles on their faces and they rush to the door. Em, we have guests, David shouts, and we see Emily just kind of mooch down the stairs. David fixes them some tea and he and Elizabeth sit in the living room to drink it. She sees a photo frame of him, Emily, and Allison. Is that your wife? She casually asks as she pours her tea. She passed away. Oh, I'm sorry, says Elizabeth. Yeah, no matter how many times I say it, it still sounds so strange. Elizabeth says that it must be so hard for Emily to adjust to this and to deal with the loss of her mother. David just changes the subject and instead he asks Elizabeth if she's ever been married. Um, yeah, you know, I actually just got divorced. I'm living with my sister now. The best way to get over the past is to start something new she says. Yeah, that's why we're here, David says with a weak smile. Upstairs in Emily's room, Amy is jumping up and down, playing, and just being really happy. You know, she looks excited at the fact that they're having a play date, and Emily has all these dolls, so she's just grabbing the dolls and just playing with them, and she's trying to have a good time. On the other hand, Emily is just lying on her bed, facing the other way, looking really annoyed by Amy's presence. Amy tells her that she will like it here in this new town, and she goes to look at all of the dolls on Emily's shelf. She's beautiful. What's her name? 
She asks as she holds the doll up. When Emily doesn't reply, she sarcastically says, well, you don't talk much, do you? And without even looking back at Amy, Emily says, you shouldn't be here. What? Why? Amy starts walking up slowly to Emily when all of a sudden Emily turns around and she just snaps at her and says, you could get hurt. And she holds up a doll with a smashed face for Amy to see. So obviously their play date was cut short because Amy was freaked out by this. I mean, imagine going over to another little girl's house. You're excited to play dolls and just get to know her. But then this girl is so creepy and doesn't even talk to you in the first place, but then also smashes her doll's face and then tells you that you could get hurt if if you're here. It's very creepy so obviously Amy leaves the house running and she goes to her car and tells her aunt that she's ready to leave. Elizabeth gets up and she starts putting on her coat while David walks her out to her car. So um you have my number? David says yeah I'll talk to you soon and they kiss each other on the cheek and then Elizabeth walks out towards her car. Bye Emily Elizabeth shouts as she gets inside her car. Now, back inside, Emily is sitting at the top of the staircase and David asks her, what did you think of Amy? And Emily doesn't look too happy about this. I don't need any more friends. And she walks back up the stairs, leaving David standing alone there. Now, the following day, David is doing dishes and through the window, he sees that Emily is outside playing hopscotch all alone. He finishes up the dishes and as he's drying his hands off with the dish towel, he sees that there is one knife from the knife block that is sticking out as if it wasn't placed back properly after being used. He thinks that this is a little bit odd. I mean, who took the knife out of the knife block and why didn't they put it back in correctly? He goes back over to the window to go look at Emily and make sure that she's okay. And he sees that Emily is no longer alone. Now, a man is sitting next to her, watching her play hopscotch. Of course, concerned that an older, strange man is just with his daughter all alone, he rushes outside to see what's going on. The man stands up and says, Sorry, I didn't mean to intrude. I'm Steven. Laura's my husband from next door. Now remember, Laura is the neighbor that came by earlier to give him the jams. David says, Oh, it's nice to meet you. And Steven smiles back and shakes his hand. We're gonna be neighbors, you know, so... We might as well be neighborly, right? Yeah, right, David says awkwardly. He motions to Emily to head back inside and he tells Stephen that they have a really busy day ahead of them. At first, Emily doesn't listen to her dad and she just stays still. David tells her again sternly to go back inside and Emily just kind of looks over at Stephen and says, bye, before going back inside the house. As they're both approaching the door, Stephen abruptly says, David, and David turns around kind of annoyed. Like he already told this guy that they don't want to talk to him and that they need to leave. So why is this guy still trying to talk to him? So David turns around to see what Stephen is trying to tell him. And that's when Stephen says, you're very lucky to have such a beautiful daughter. And he says that with a very serious look on his face. David simply thanks him and they both head inside and Stephen just walks away. Inside, David asks Emily, do you remember what I told you about not talking to strangers? He's not a stranger, snaps Emily. He's our neighbor. And she just starts walking away. Well, as far as I know, he's a stranger, honey. And don't walk away when I'm talking to you. Emily stops and says, I'm sorry, daddy. Weren't you finished? No, I wasn't finished, replies David. And Emily just continues walking away annoyed. Right now, David is wondering, you know, is that guy Charlie? Is that the new friend that Emily says she found? Maybe he's not an imaginary friend. Maybe he's a real guy that's just trying to be friends with my nine-year-old daughter. So later that night, David sets a tea kettle on the stove and he quickly goes into his office to get something. But as soon as he walks into his office, he hears a noise, kind of like a thumb sound coming from upstairs. And then all of a sudden, the tea kettle starts whistling. He's kind of confused by this. I mean, he barely put the kettle on the stove, there's no way that the water was already boiling. He rushes out of the office and he sees that the kitchen is filled with smoke and the tea kettle is splashing like crazy. So he turns off the stove and he goes upstairs to check on Emily since he heard thumps. He opens her bedroom door and Emily is sitting on the edge of her bed facing the other twin bed, smiling. David asks her, what are you doing, Emily? Nothing, she giggles. What's so funny? Is Charlie here? He just left. Well, where did he go? And Emily motions to the window with her head. 
David glances over and sees that the window that he could not open the other night was now wide open with fresh air blowing in. Confused, he asks Emily, how did you open the window? Emily says, I thought you did. And David rushes out to the window and looks out, but he doesn't see anything and he just shuts the window. At this point, David is getting a little bit creeped out. You know, what is going on? Who opened this window? Where did Charlie go? Is Charlie real or is he still imaginary? He sits besides Emily and he asks to speak with Charlie. Well, what would you like to talk about with him? Asks Emily. Well, I'd like to talk to him about all sorts of things. Like what? Like, um, well, what makes him happy? What makes him sad? So what do you say? He introduce us? Emily says, I don't think that's gonna work. Why is that? And she just shakes her head and says, he doesn't like you very much. Confused by this, David asks Emily, why doesn't he like me very much? Does it have something to do with mommy? And Emily just stays quiet. Well, what does Charlie tell you? What's going on? And Emily just doesn't respond. He decides to end the conversation there and Emily goes to sleep. Later that night, David is sitting at his desk in the dim light, writing how Emily is doing in his journal while listening to jazz through his headphones. Rain is pouring outside in the windows behind him and upstairs, Emily is supposed to be sleeping, but she's awake. She's in the room by herself, whispering 3-1000, 4-1000, 5-1000, 6 7 with her hands covering her eyes. She's playing hide and seek, but with who? She lifts her hands from her eyes and says, ready or not, here I come. She glances towards her closet door and slowly approaches it. She stands in front of the doors and then quickly opens it but sees nothing. She then heads outside her room to the hallway and she has this big smile on her face and she starts chanting, Charlie, Charlie. She starts walking down the stairs but still sees nothing. She opens the downstairs hallway closet and she pushes the hanging coats to the side to reveal a hidden door. She opens the hidden door, sticks her head in and says, Charlie, come out, come out, wherever you are. She slowly walks into the pitch black, goes down the small set of stairs and pulls on a string light to turn on the light. The light uncovers an abandoned room with furniture covered in dust, broken items and a red bicycle hanging upside down. She takes a look around the room and walks in slowly. The hanging bike is gently swinging, making a faint squeaking noise. She does a 360 to kind of look around and she sees a bed and examines it closely. The bed looks like it was freshly made and it isn't covered in dust like everything else, so it seems like someone's been using this bed. But who? As she's looking at this, she suddenly hears whispers and a thump, which startle her as the lights go out at the same time. She screams at the top of her lungs and through his headphone, David hears her scream. He starts screaming her name, wondering, you know, where are you? What's going on? And he runs to grab a flashlight and he rushes to the closet door and goes down the staircase. He finds Emily curled up, leaning against the wall with tears coming down her face and she is just struck with terror. He asks her, you know, what are you doing in this room? How did you even get in here? And through her crying, Emily says, he was hiding. David flinches at a large thump and when he turns around, he sees that there's a water boiler in the room and that's what's making the noise. So he quickly turns on the light and Emily just numbly asks him, can I go to bed now? So this was definitely a very creepy incident. I mean, David is so confused. Like, how was Charlie hiding here? How did you even get in this room? I mean, what even is this room? Because he didn't even know that it existed. The next morning, Emily is lying awake in bed with her cheek pressed against the pillow, blankly staring ahead. Laura, the next door neighbor, rings a doorbell and David opens up. Lauren asks him if he has a minute and David lets her inside. He closes the door behind her and Laura shyly says, I wanted to apologize for my husband. He said he had an awkward moment yesterday with you and Emily. Laura reassures David and says, he's harmless, really, he wouldn't hurt a fly. No, that's fine, David reiterates. Laura then goes on to explain how her and Stephen actually lost a child recently, a little girl. 
who Emily reminds him of. David looks down and says, I see. And Laura is just intensely staring back at him. There is nothing worse in this world than losing a child. David nods in agreement and then Laura leaves. Later that night, Emily is in her bedroom, gently taking out a box from underneath her bed labeled Mommy's Thing. At the same time, Elizabeth, the woman that we met earlier with Amy, is downstairs in the house and she's there in the kitchen cooking with David, just kind of getting dinner ready. So it seems like David invited Elizabeth to come over and have dinner with him and Emily. So the two of them are setting up the dinner table when all of a sudden Emily interrupts them. And when David turns to look at his daughter, he's speechless. Emily is now wearing the last clothes and jewelry that her mom ever wore. The same black elegant dress that Allison was wearing the night she died. Elizabeth with of course doesn't know this so she innocently says you didn't have to get all dressed up for me and David of course knows what this outfit represents so he tells Emily honey would you go upstairs and please change into something else don't you like it says Emily no not for dinner why not you know why Elizabeth steps in and says that they should just eat their dinner and that the outfit is fine and you know of course David doesn't want to fight in front of the guests so he just allows Emily to wear this outfit they're now sitting together at the dinner table eating in silence. Emily breaks the silence with, did daddy tell you my mommy died? Elizabeth takes a second to think of how to reply to her and says, yes he did. Well, did he tell you how she died? David steps in and says, honey, I don't think Elizabeth really wants to hear how that happened, okay? Emily just cuts him off and says, she killed herself in our bathtub, slit her wrist with a razor. Emily, why would you say that? He tries to get Emily to stop talking, but it seems like Emily is kind of enjoying this. Elizabeth tries to change the topic and says that she has a gift for Emily. She hands her a stack of books that used to be Amy's and tells her that these are really good books and that she hopes she enjoys them. Emily just kind of stays quiet. She doesn't thank her for the gifts. She doesn't say anything. She kind of just stares at Elizabeth and without breaking eye contact, she pushes the books off the table one by one. David grabs her by the hand and Emily turns to him and says, do you like her daddy? Stop this. Like, like, please, can you behave? Well, Charlie says you do like her, says Emily. He says you like her as much as mommy. David tries to get her to stop talking and he orders her to go to her bedroom immediately. Emily just gets up from the table, glances back at Elizabeth and says, let's hope you don't wind up like her with a straight face and goes upstairs to her bedroom. David and Elizabeth are left in silence and David just apologizes for his daughter's behavior. Elizabeth asks him, you know, who's Charlie? David explains to her that it's her imaginary friend and then they both just hear Emily slam the door upstairs. After this incredibly awkward dinner, David walks Elizabeth to her car and Emily spies on them through her window in disapproval. David then starts getting ready for bed and as he's brushing his teeth, he sees their cat sitting in the bathroom doorway staring at him while he finishes brushing his teeth. After he falls asleep, David gets another flashback. It's the same party scene we've seen twice already. Then, all of a sudden, he wakes up at 2.06 in the morning, again to the sound of the water faucet dripping. He puts on his glasses and he gets up to check what's going on. He goes into the hallway and sees that the bathroom is dimly lit once again. So, he approaches the hallway bathroom, opens the door, and sees candles lit once again. The same scene that he saw the night that his wife died, and the same scene he saw when someone had written on the shower walls. So, he approaches the shower, pulls back the curtain, and sees that now there is a new message written on the shower walls. It says, now look what you've done, with an arrow pointing down towards the bathtub filled with water. David goes to drain the water to see what's going on, and when he reaches in to grab the stopper, he pulls something out of the water. He looks at what he pulled out and realizes that it's their cat. He immediately just jumps back, gasping from shock. I mean, this is the last thing that he expected to see. Just a few hours ago he saw that the cat was in the hallway alive and well and now somebody had killed their family cats and put them in the drain.
drain. He immediately rushes to Emily's room and instead of Emily sleeping, she's already sitting on the edge of her bed with her eyes peeled as if she expected her dad to see that and immediately rushed to her. Charlie did it, she says right off the bat, and she stands up quickly. You do believe me, don't you, daddy? David doesn't respond because he's just in shock, and Emily says, why are you looking at me like that? And before she can go approach her dad, David just shuts the door and backs away from it. He is just standing there in shock, he's panting, I mean, he doesn't know what to do. Imagine coming across the scene. I mean, first of all, it's one thing for your daughter to write in crayons some creepy message, but it's another thing for your daughter to have killed the family cat. David immediately rushes downstairs to the kitchen to grab something, but he's interrupted by a sound coming from the front door. He runs over to the front door to see what's going on. And that's when he sees Mr. Haskins, the realtor who we met earlier, trying to slip an envelope underneath the door. Now, David opens the door and sees this and he even startles Mr. Haskins. David asks him, what are you doing here? And Mr. Haskins replies, I thought you might need these. And he hands David an envelope. David opens up the envelope and sees that there's just some keys inside. So those are the keys from, you know, different rooms to the house. I forgot to give them to you earlier. I apologize. David just stares back at Mr. Haskins suspiciously. It's a little late to be delivering keys, don't you think? Well, I thought I could slip them under the door. My wife and I are going to Canada first thing in the morning. We've actually got a little cabin tucked away in the woods. It's a good place to clear the mind, he says smiling. Is everything all right? David just ignores him and he heads back inside to take their cat out of the bathtub. He places the cat in a trash bag while he clears a message off of the shower walls. He then grabs a shovel from the shed outside and begins digging a hole to bury the cat in the surrounding woods. I mean, this night was just completely chaotic. I mean, what the heck happened? Who killed the cat? Why is Emily blaming Charlie if Charlie is just an imaginary friend? I mean, is his daughter just a killer? Like, did something happen after her mom's death that triggered this and now Emily is acting out by killing the family's cat? He's also a little bit confused and suspicious of Mr. Haskins. I mean, yes, he's their realtor and it makes sense that he was trying to give them some keys to the house, but why was he doing this so suspiciously? Suspiciously. Is Mr. Haskins Charlie? Okay, brownies are ready, you guys. They came out so good. Like, I just tried one. They tasted delicious. They look a little ugly right here because I saved the other half in case someone doesn't want, like, all the frosting because I know some people don't like frosting. So I have my googly eyes here to kind of make the mummy eyes. And now we're going to decorate this half, but, like, look at how good that looks. Nice and chunky and chocolatey. Ugh, amazing. So this is what we're trying to recreate. It looks easy, trust me, but I tried to do this last year and it came out like a complete fail. So this year I bought something that might make a little bit easier. I bought frosting that's already like in a bag because before I was trying to do this type of frosting and I tried to put it in like a Ziploc and like do it myself, but it just did not turn out good. So first I'm gonna put a layer of chocolate because I'm a chocolate girl. So I want some extra chocolate fudge on there and then on top of it, we're gonna put the white frosting and kind of use that to make like the mummy wrapping if that makes sense so let's see how this turns out going back to this story the following morning david is in the kitchen looking very tired i mean it has been a long night their cat was found dead someone had murdered the cat the realtor stopped by last night like just so much weird stuff happened last night and of course david is exhausted so he's sitting in the kitchen just kind of blankly staring out and all of a sudden emily just comes down the stairs skipping cheerfully looking very happy asking her dad what's for breakfast as if their cat wasn't found dead last night there's a stack of pancakes on the table and emily just starts digging into the pancakes david just kind of stares at her before asking with a concerned tone honey why would charlie do such a horrible thing emily just ignores him is it because of elizabeth david pushes Charlie's got to understand something. Elizabeth is not trying to take mommy's place. Does he understand that? Emily just ignores him again and he asks her, why doesn't he like Elizabeth? And Emily just quickly responds, because she likes you. He doesn't want you to be happy. Honey, you know this has nothing to do with Charlie, right? You know that. It's about you, honey. Charlie doesn't exist. You shouldn't say that, Emily says with a serious face. Why not? You'll get him mad. 
okay, I'll get him mad. Let him come out here and yell at me. Good. Like, I want to see him. Where is he? Emily just softly responds to her dad and says, you want to see him? And she takes David upstairs to her bedroom. And when he enters a room, he looks confused. There's nobody in there. It's completely empty and it's just the two of them. So where's Charlie? He continues walking around the room just trying to find Charlie and he sees that there are a lot of drawings hanging on the walls of Emily's bedroom and they're drawings of stick figures. He approaches a drawing with three people. David asks, who's that supposed to be? Charlie and mommy. She would have liked him. David shakes his head and says, no, trust me, honey. Mommy wouldn't like Charlie. That's not what he says. Emily snaps. David turns around and demands to know what exactly Charlie is saying. Like, how is Charlie telling you this? Like, when did Charlie tell you that he would like your mom? Like, what is happening? And Emily just hesitantly says, he says he would have satisfied her. David just backs up in shock. Who told you to say that? He asks. Charlie did. No, who told you that? Insists David. Charlie did. Emily says again, there is no Charlie, so who said it? David asks aggressively with his hands on Emily's shoulder. Charlie did. Charlie did. Charlie did. Emily yells and starts singing, Charlie, Charlie, over and over again. So after their little arguments, Catherine, the psychologist, and the family friend pulls up to the house and Emily runs out the door with a big smile on her face and she has her arms wide open and she runs up and just gives Catherine the biggest hug ever. Catherine hugs her back and lifts her up into the air are just so happy to see her. They walk into the house with David and they go to Emily's room. Emily has her jewelry box open and they're listening to the melody while Emily puts makeup on a doll she has propped up on a chair. Now it's just Catherine and Emily in this room and Catherine just wants to speak to Emily to see what's going on. I'm sure David called her and probably told her like this imaginary friend Charlie is getting out of control. He's telling Emily to say these terrible things. He's isolating her. He's making her write these terrible things on the wall. I don't know if he did tell her about the dead cat because I feel like Catherine would have like immediately taken Emily to like a psychiatric unit or something. So Catherine is there to kind of just speak to Emily and see what's going on. Catherine is sitting on the floor next to Emily with her back against the bed and she asks Emily, tell me something about your friend Charlie. He doesn't like when I talk about him. Emily replies, well, I'm sure he wouldn't mind if he told me. Emily stays quiet and she focuses on putting the makeup on her doll. Well, what do you guys do together? And Emily says that they like to play games. Oh, okay. Well, he sounds fun. And she looks down at the jewelry box that she gave Emily. Inside the jewelry box, she sees a cutout photo of David's head. So she goes on to ask Emily what they talk about, and Emily just shrugs. We talk about a bunch of things. Sometimes he even talks about you. Catherine looks at her surprised, and Emily says, He's afraid you're going to get in the way. In the way of what? Catherine asks. Of our game. Well, what game is that? Upsetting daddy. Emily replies right off the bat. Emily finishes putting the makeup on her doll and she holds up and asks Catherine if she thinks the doll looks pretty. Catherine simply smiles back at her and she's obviously very shocked and frightened at this conversation. So after their talk, Catherine tells David that she feels it would be best if Emily went back to live with her in New York because obviously Emily isn't doing well. David says that he knows she's not doing well. He doesn't think taking her back to New York would be good because because she's going to be away from her dad and from this new house and it's just too much change all at once. So he recommends that Emily continues to stay with him. So David doesn't want Emily to go live with Catherine in New York City because he wants to be with her and he wants to help his daughter. But Catherine says that it would be worth at least trying this. Like maybe her going back, spending time with Catherine and spending time with doctors might help her get out of whatever's going through her mind because obviously Emily just isn't doing well. David just doesn't want to budge on this so he tells Catherine you know okay how about you give me two weeks if in two weeks there's no improvement then I will send Emily back to New York City and 
we can go from there. Catherine agrees to this plan and then she heads back to New York City. Now, later that day, Emily is in the shower upstairs humming the melody from the jewelry box as David walks past her towards her bedroom. He wants to kind of take advantage of the fact that Emily's in the shower so that he can kind of snoop around her bedroom and just see if there's anything in there that could tell him what's going on with his daughter. Like maybe she has Charlie's real name written around there somewhere, maybe his address, maybe who he is, or there's just something there that could help him kind of just figure out if Charlie is real. He starts looking around Emily's bedroom and that's when he realizes that all her dolls are gone. Her shelves are completely empty. He reaches for her nightstand and he pulls out the diary that he gave her on the first night they moved in. He starts flipping through the diary to see if maybe there's something on there that could help, but the diary is empty. There are no words on the diary, only a flip book style sketches of her mom in the bathtub slitting her wrists. He is just so confused as to why Emily would draw this and then he is startled when all of a sudden he hears Emily say, what are you doing daddy? He jumps up and says, nothing. What were you looking at? insists Emily. David turns around and starts uncovering the bed, you know, to get ready to tuck her in and says, nothing, I was just getting ready to tuck you in. Emily jumps into bed and David tucks her in and gives her a forehead kiss. He turns off the light and starts to walk away and he leaves the door ajar, just like he does every single night because Emily likes that the hallway light creeps in through the door. So he starts walking away, but that's when Emily shouts, Daddy, can you close the door? What, you don't want the light anymore? No, I don't need it anymore, replies Emily. He does what she asks and he shuts the door. After this, he goes into his bedroom and he just sits on the side of his bed thinking about what's happening to his family. He's just kind of sitting there contemplating what to do when all of a sudden he realizes that he can see his next door neighbors through their windows, the ones that we met earlier, Stephen and Laura. So he turns off the light in his room, he grabs his telescope and he points it towards their house to see what's going on there. Because again, he's kind of a little sketched out by Stephen, especially because he was like, oh, your daughter's so beautiful and he was talking to her all alone. He just feels a little bit weirded out by him. So he points the telescope into their living room and he can see that Laura and Steven are fighting. Laura keeps motioning towards David's house and he can't make out what they're arguing about, but he just gets a weird feeling. I mean, why are you fighting and pointing at my house? To be honest, these look really bad. Like, these do not look like a mummy. I don't know what is so impossible about recreating this recipe. No, bueno. So the next morning, David decides to kind of go investigate the next door neighbors. They're just acting really weird. The fact that they were fighting last night, pointing towards his house just confuses him and kind of just worries him. So he decides to go to Laura and Steven's house the next morning and return the favors of giving them jams. Laura is really happy to see him and she welcomes David into her home and they go inside the living room and take a seat. David is kind of just looking around the house, just kind of trying to get to know who these neighbors are. And he sees that the house is filled with toys and stuffed animals and just things for little kids. He also sees a lot of photo frames of the family with their daughter who passed away. Laura sees him staring at the photos and she apologizes for the mess and says that he must think they're crazy for keeping all of these kids toys around since their daughter is no longer alive. She attempts to clean up the toys a little bit but she just breaks down crying and sits down. David crouches down beside her and tells her that it's okay Okay. He's a licensed psychologist and he has helped many people who have been through grief in the past and he also offers his help. Laura confesses that Stephen has actually been having a really hard time dealing with the loss of their daughter and that for the past few weeks, things have not been good between them. Laura says, you have no idea how painful he can make it. I'm sorry, I've already said too much. David tries to get more information out of her. You know, he's like, what's going on? I mean, I can help you. Like, what is Stephen doing? And Laura just says, no, I can't say anything. Stephen will be back any moment. And she tells David that he needs to leave. David returns home feeling defeated because he feels like Laura is trying to tell him something about Steven. You know, maybe Steven is Charlie. Maybe he's a bad guy that befriended Emily, told her that his name was Charlie and he's the one doing all of these crazy things around the house. Okay, pausing the story real quick. The brownies, this is what they look like. 
Yeah. Let's not talk about them. They taste good, but they look ugly. Anyways, going back to the story, he goes back home and it begins to rain. And that's when Elizabeth pulls up with a bouquet of flowers and knocks on the door. David doesn't hear the knock since he's in his office wearing his headphones. So Elizabeth just lets herself into the house. She shouts over the heavy rain for David, but David doesn't respond. She continues walking around the house and shouts, Emily? And that's when she hears a thump from upstairs. Elizabeth goes up the steps and says, hello, David, Emily, but gets no response. She opens Emily's bedroom as she asks, Emily, are you in there? And sees that Emily is sitting at the foot of her bed, blankly staring ahead. Emily just glances over at Elizabeth and says, daddy's not here. Okay, well, I'm actually here to see you. Here, I got you some daisies. I didn't know which color you would like, so I got you one of every color. And she hands Emily a bouquet of daisies. Elizabeth goes on to apologize and says that she isn't trying to replace her mom. But Emily just ignores her apology and asks her, Do you like games? I love games. Do you want to play one? I'm already playing. Well, what are you playing? Asks Elizabeth. Hide and seek. Well, don't you need another person to play hide and seek? How are you playing by yourself? Emily replies, he's hiding. Who's hiding? Charlie's hiding. Elizabeth slowly nods her head and says, Charlie's hiding? Where is he hiding? Emily glances over to the closet in her bedroom and Elizabeth follows. Okay, you stay here. And Elizabeth slowly starts approaching the closet saying, Charlie, Charlie, come out, come out wherever you are. And she swings open the closet door and all of a sudden she just goes completely pale. Her heart nearly stops and she screamed at what was in the closet. She starts backing up while screaming because she's so scared of what she just saw in there. And as she's backing up, she actually breaks the window glass and falls to her death. Now, David is downstairs and he's woken up by the sound of the impact and his eyes just shoot open because he was in his office working, listening to his headphones and he kind of just dozed off. So he wakes up confused and he gets up to look for Emily. I mean, at this point, he has no idea that Elizabeth even came to the house. So he's walking around and he goes to turn off the television that was left on and in the living room, he realizes that all of their family photo frames have his face cut out of them, every single one. Now, this just sends such a bad feeling down his body and he rushes upstairs to Emily's bedroom. He walks in and sees Emily on the floor drawing. What are you drawing, honey? He asks. She ignores him. And as she gets closer to her, he sees over her shoulder that she's drawing a woman falling out of the window. He quickly looks out at the window in the bedroom and realizes that the window is broken. He approaches it slowly and he looks down, but he only sees broken window glass. No body, like the drawing would indicate. So what happened to Elizabeth's body? Now, before he could even question Emily about how the window broke and about what the heck she's drawing, the doorbell suddenly ring. It's the sheriff. David rushes down to answer and opens a door. Sheriff Hafferty tells David, hi, I'm afraid I have some bad news. There's been an accident. I found Elizabeth's young crash car on the side of the road. Well, is she okay? David says with a concerned face. I don't know. She wasn't in the car. I spoke to her niece, Amy, and she told me that she was on her way here to see you. Have you seen her? No, I, I haven't seen her. It's just me and Emily. Now, Emily is on the staircase eavesdropping to everything that's going on downstairs. And the sheriff is like, okay, well, do you mind if I come inside to get a glass of water? Sure, of course, come on in. And he invites the sheriff into the home. While David goes to grab the glass of water, the sheriff takes a walk around and he also realizes that the family's photos have only David's face cut out of them. So he's obviously confused by this and he says out loud how he thought Elizabeth crashed on her way up to the house. But on a second thought, he saw tire tracks leading down the road, indicating that she had made it to David's house. David returns with a glass of water and says, well, maybe she forgot something or turned around. I don't know, but I haven't seen Elizabeth. The sheriff obviously it looks a little bit suspicious of David and says, well, maybe Emily's seen her. No, that's not possible. I mean, Emily hasn't left the house. She's been in her room all day. The sheriff insists on asking Emily if she's seen Elizabeth and David calls her down. Emily comes to the top of the staircase and the sheriff asks her, Emily, do 
Do you know Elizabeth Young? Have you seen her combine the last few hours? No. If I stepped away for a minute, are you sure there's nothing you'd want to tell your daddy? He asks. Emily says, I'm sure. The sheriff nods and says, good girl. Go up to your room to play, and Emily runs back up the stairs. The sheriff tells David that if he hears anything from Elizabeth or he hears anything about what happened to her, that he should give him a call and that he was going to be going around the neighborhood asking everyone else if they've seen or heard anything too. So he says goodbye to David and he leaves the house. As soon as the sheriff leaves, David rushes upstairs calling Emily's name. He barely makes it to the top of the staircase when he sees that Emily is standing against the wall, sobbing. Emily, where is she? asks David. Emily just doesn't reply and instead, she holds up a toy clock that reads the time 2.06 a.m. Which of course, as we know, is every single time that David wakes up from his nightmare. David sees this and he just enters a state of panic and shock. He rushes to the bathroom since he knows that there will be another message waiting for him like all the other nights. Because remember, at 2.06 in the morning for the past three nights, he has woken up to something in the bathtub. So he runs into the bathroom, opens the door, sees that there are candles lit, and on the shower curtain, written in red, is, Can you see now? He opens up the shower curtain and sees Elizabeth's body lying in the tub with water. Her legs are stiff and bent, her eyes are wide open, and her arms are laid out on the side of the tub. Frantic with fear, David lets out a scream and he backs away from the tub in terror. He runs out and he grabs Emily and asks her, what did you do? While well, he carries Emily to her bedroom and Emily is just sobbing and shouts, I didn't do anything. Well, who did it? Asks David fiercely. Charlie did it, Charlie did it. Don't say Charlie, he shouts at her. He's just so frustrated at this point and he's just filled with panic because there's literally a body in his bathroom and there was a sheriff in their house like five seconds ago asking what happened to Elizabeth. He is so mad at this point that he just begs Emily to tell him the truth and says, okay, who is Charlie? Just tell me, where is he? And Emily whispers, I can't. David sits with her and through his panting asks, did you have a part in this? Emily just stays quiet and David asks her again, this time more aggressive, and Emily whispers, he made me help him. He made me do this. David grabs a drawing Emily was making earlier and he points to the man that Emily drew and asks, is that Charlie? Emily says that she just can't say and says, I'm sorry. Unsure of what to do next, David orders Emily to stay in her room while he figures out what to do. Emily starts crying and says, no, please don't leave me. Please don't leave me. But David shuts the door and he locks it using the keys that Mr. Haskins gave him earlier. Inside the room, Emily is just screaming, saying, you can't stop him, daddy. You can't stop him. But David is just running around the house at this point, trying to figure out what to do next. He goes goes into his office and he rips up the drawing and he takes a moment to just sit down and cry. I mean, so much has happened in his life in the past few weeks. I mean, his wife died, he had to move to a new location, his daughter is going through a difficult time, he can't connect with his daughter, now she has an imaginary friend and now people around them are dying. So he's taking a moment to cry while upstairs, Emily is trying to pick the lock when all of a sudden she's startled by a thump on the other side of the door. She backs up and she sees that the doorknob is rattling. Someone on the outside in the hallway is trying to open her door. She takes a step back to see who it is. Is it Charlie? But the door suddenly just opens by itself, no one standing there. The keys that Mr. Haskins gave to David the other night are just hanging from the lock. So. Obviously, someone took the keys and unlocked the door for Emily to leave. Emily slowly walks downstairs to the living room and she calls Catherine, the psychologist, on the phone. Catherine says, hello? And Emily says, I don't want to play with Charlie anymore. Emily, where's your father? Catherine asks. Daddy can't save me now. She sobs. Emily then hears a door open and footsteps approaching her. So she gets scared thinking that it's Charlie and she hangs up the phone. Now, meanwhile, David is still in his office trying to think of what to do. He goes into the hallway wearing a trench coat, carrying a plastic bag to dispose of the body. But when he enters the bathroom, 
Elizabeth's body is gone. At the doorway, Emily is staring at him, saying, Charlie just left. David immediately darts out of the house to try to catch Charlie. I mean, this needs to stop. Whatever Charlie is doing, if he's the real killer, if he's making Emily do these things, David wants to catch him. So he runs out of the house and Emily is shouting from her window saying, he's hiding, he's hiding. Outside, it's windy, it's dark, and it's cold. And David is just running around in circles trying to find Charlie. He turns back to the house and that's when he suddenly runs into his neighbor, Stephen. Stephen is just standing there in front of David. David points the flashlight towards his face and he also has a knife in his other hand and says, you. Stephen raises his hand to try to cover the light because it's really bright and he says, sorry, I heard some noises coming from your house and I saw you come out of the woods with a shovel. Is everything all right? David snaps back and says, no. Well, is Emily all right? Asked Stephen. You stay away from her. Stay away from us. I want to see her, demands Stephen. And they kind of just get into an argument back and forth about Stephen demanding to see Emily. And David just tells him to stay away from the family. And he kind of starts slashing his knife on Stephen. And he actually slashes Stephen's hand. After this, David runs back in the house. He drops a flashlight and Stephen runs after him. He nearly makes it inside their home but David slashes his hand once again, forcing Stephen to back away from the door and David just locks himself in. At this point, David is panting, he's confused, and he's scared. I mean, this whole thing feels even more chaotic because the TV is turned on in the living room and it's playing a children's cartoon with like this cheerful music. And Emily is sitting at the top of the staircase just sobbing. It's just a really crazy scene and David is going up to each window, pulling behind the curtains, to see where Stephen is and all of a sudden Stephen pops up in front of the windows and David screams at him you get away you stay away and Stephen finally backs away. Emily comes down sobbing saying that Charlie will be back that she absolutely knows it and David just hugs her and tries to comfort her and tells her that Charlie is gone now and that he's sorry he didn't believe her. At this point Stephen is Charlie. Emily is begging David to never see Charlie ever again and for her dad to never leave her again. In the distance while David is hugging Emily he hears a door creak open. He gets up and walks down the hallway and sees his office door. He starts approaching the office door because there's a sound coming from there. But when he walks inside, he sees that his office is completely different than what we've seen it look like. Before, the office was organized. All the boxes were unpacked. There were books on the bookshelf. His notebook was on his desk. His headphones were there and he had hung up his plaque and, and it looked like a ready-to-use office. But now, the office was empty. All of his things were packed up in the boxes. Nothing was hanging on the walls. There was nothing on the bookshelf. He couldn't find his notebook or his headphones. I mean, it seems like the office had never been unpacked in the first place. So he looks at this, pauses, and realizes what is happening. He goes to open up one of the boxes and he takes out his headphones. His headphones that he was using when he would write how Emily was doing in the notebook. Why were his headphones packed inside a closed box if he has been using these for the past few weeks? He then reaches for another box, opens it up, and sees that the notebook is in there. He grabs the notebook and starts going through the pages because for the past few weeks, that's where he's been writing all of Emily's behavior. But there are no words written on any of the pages. He stands there confused and he starts to get flashbacks of everything that has happened in the few weeks. He's so confused just standing there thinking, you know, What's his reality? He starts having these flashbacks and this time we see the full flashback that he was dreaming of in the middle of the night. The flashback of what happened the night his wife died. That night, him and his wife were out celebrating New Year's. It looks like they were at a very fancy party in New York and all of a sudden, Allison slips away from the party. David follows his wife to see where she's going and that's when he catches her with another man. She's at the top of the staircase getting kissed by this man and David realizes that his wife is having an affair. He gets really angry at this and he doesn't confront his wife. He waits until they get home from the party and while they're lying in bed trying to go to sleep, David grabs a pillow and suffocates his wife to death. After this, he moves her body to the bathtub and stages her body to make it look like 
Allison had taken her own life. Then he gets a different flashback. He remembers Elizabeth's scared face looking right at him when she opened the closet door to find Charlie. He sees that Elizabeth dug her nails into his forearm as she was falling out of the window. So he looks down at his arms and pulls back his sleeves and sees that there are scratch marks on him. Then he gets another flashback of him standing there in the window looking down as Elizabeth's body lies on the ground. His flashbacks finally come to an end and that's when he realizes that he is Charlie. This entire time he thought that Charlie was an imaginary friend or that it was Steven the neighbor or that it was Mr. Haskins or that it was just Emily being crazy and using Charlie as an excuse. But now he realizes that he's been the problem all along. He's the one that's been committing all of these murders. He's the one that killed his cat, killed Allison, and killed Elizabeth. Now that he realizes this, he's just standing in his office in silence. His body is still. You can hear the rain pouring outside the window. And Emily is standing behind him crying. Do you see now, Daddy? David continues to stay quiet. His eyes pace back and forth when all of a sudden he turns around and says to Emily, it's okay now. Daddy's gone now with an eerie smile on his face. In the living room, the cartoons are still playing and Sheriff Hafferty is back at the house knocking on the door asking for David. No one answers, so Sheriff Hafferty uses the key that he has since he normally patrols these houses and he walks into the house. Hello? He says out loud, he sees that the phone cords are cut and it's just completely silent in the house besides the sound of the cartoons playing. He walks upstairs and says, hello, but doesn't hear anyone. He enters Emily's room and sees her crouched behind her bed in the corner. Emily? Hey, where's your dad? A neighbor called and said that there was a problem. Is everything all right? Emily doesn't look up. She's still crying and sniffling. He looks over her shoulder and sees that Emily is drawing something. What are you drawing there? He asks. Emily looks up with tears running down her face and says, you, dying. The lights then suddenly go out and the sheriff is startled. He grabs his flashlight and when he turns around, he sees that Emily is gone. He goes downstairs and tries to turn on the lights, but there's no power. And then all of a sudden, he hears a faint voice say, Marco. And the sheriff turns startled and says, Hello? He walks around the house trying to see, you know, what's going on? Where's Emily? Where's David? And that's when he hears another faint, Marco, and a door creak open. It's the hallway closet door that's now open. The sheriff enters the door and he finds a circuit breaker panel and he turns back on the power. The lights are on again and he kind of just sighs of relief. He exits the closet and when he goes to close the door, a broom that fell stops it from closing all the way. So he lifts up the broom, places it back in the closet, and and as he closes the door, all of a sudden, we see David standing there with an axe in his hand. And David says, Polo, and then he hits the sheriff on the head with the axe. So he hits the sheriff with the axe, and meanwhile, Emily is coming down the stairs with tears still coming down her face, and she sees her dad dragging the sheriff's body into the hallway closet. She slowly approaches the door, and she peeks her head through before closing it, and she tries to lock the door. I mean, at this point, she is scared. She doesn't know if her dad is still there or if now Charlie has taken over. She tries to lock the door, but then she realizes that the lock has been removed. She rushes to the kitchen to try to find a stick or something to place in the lock hole to keep the door from opening. And she finds a wooden spoon, so she rushes back to stick the spoon handle in the lock, but she sees that the door is wide open again and that her dad is sitting on a bench in front of the door. Emily immediately gets startled and she just drops the wooden spoon on the floor. David looks at the wooden spoon on the floor and says, I can't help but sense a certain tension between us. Emily just stays quiet. What's the matter? Don't you want to play anymore? Don't you want to have fun? Hmm? Is it that you want your daddy back? Is that it? You like him more than me, don't you? He eerily says. Emily manages to reply, no. Oh, you're such a liar, he smiles. I'm not, Emily whispers. Liar, liar, you're a big fat liar, sings Charlie. Emily just blurts out, you killed mommy. And David or I guess Charlie just stares blankly back at her and says, one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000. And he's saying this as he's covering his eyes with his bloody hand, still holding a bloody knife. Emily knows that it's time to play hide and seek. And she quickly runs upstairs while he finishes counting. Outside, 
Catherine is pulling up to the house. Yes, Catherine got scared when Emily had called her earlier saying that she no longer wanted to play with Charlie and she drove an hour to the house just to check in on her. So she sees the cop car in the driveway and she's confused. She sees that the door is wide open and she enters the house and says, hello? But the house is silent. She walks in slowly and she sees the bloody shovel and the trail of blood leading into the closet. Catherine is in shock by this and she screams out again, hello? She enters the hallway closet and sees the staircase that leads to the darkness. She turns around and she's suddenly startled by David just standing there right behind her. Oh god, David, you scared me. David just looks at her in silence and she's like, David? But David shakes his head, insinuating, no, it's not David. And then he hits Catherine on the head and pushes her down the hallway closet stairs. Catherine tumbles down and she groans from the painful fall. She tries to get up, but that's when she sees the sheriff's body right in front of her. His body is just propped up right there and he's all bloody and she's just so shocked by this. Now upstairs, David goes to look for Emily in her bedroom. He enters the room and says, that's funny. I could have sworn I saw a little girl by the name of Emily come up here. He starts walking around Emily's bedroom and says, Emily, I wonder where she could be. Could she be under the bed? Emily's not there. He chuckles and says, could she be hiding in the closet? He says as he sticks his knife in between the closet shutters. He pulls it out and opens a closet, but no Emily. Now, meanwhile, down in the basement, Catherine reaches into the sheriff's pocket to look for his gun when all of a sudden she lets out a scream because the sheriff is still alive. He grabs her hand and just kind of stares back at her. Going back to David, he is still upstairs walking around trying to find Emily. He walks into the bathroom and he's sliding his knife against the shower curtain and humming. He rapidly pulls open the shower curtain expecting to see Emily standing there, but she's not. We can see Emily quickly run out from behind him into the hallway and into her bedroom and she locks the door just before David gets to her. He starts pounding down the door and Emily is inside freaking out trying to think of what to do. She looks at the window and thinks, I guess that's my only option. I have to climb out the window and jump to the ground. Going back to Catherine, she's downstairs trying to get out from the basement but David put the wooden spoon in the door lock so she's trying to kick the door down. David is still upstairs and he sees Emily through the window running towards the woods. She's trying to run towards the cave that she's saw the first day they move into. I mean, where else can she go? They're very isolated. It's not like she can run into town. The neighbors are crazy. So she just decides to go to the cave and hide. David starts running after her. And in the same time, Catherine was able to finally knock down the closet door and she has the gun in her hand and she starts going to Emily's room. She sees that there's all these drawings in Emily's room. And in the distance, she hears David screaming, Emily. So she rushes to the window and she sees David outside chasing after Emily. Catherine knows that something is wrong. I mean, at this point, she doesn't know that David is Charlie and that Charlie is this evil person that has been doing all of these crazy things, but she just knows that something is off. I mean, this isn't the David that she's always known. So she immediately starts running after David and Emily. And in the meantime, David is about to enter the cave when he says, Emily, your daddy's looking for you. He turns on his bright flashlight and Emily is hiding behind a rock trying to be silent. David is walking around trying to look for her and just as he's about to discover her behind the rock, he points his flashlight down and sees all of Emily's dolls floating in water along with a jewelry box that Catherine gave her. He tucks his flashlight under his elbow and he picks up the jewelry box. He opens it and the melody starts playing. He places it on a log and he floats it down to the water. Catherine gets near the cave entrance and she walks in slowly pointing her gun. Now, she doesn't have a flashlight and it's really dark in there. So she gets startled by David pointing his bright flashlight to her face. Charlie? She asks. No, no, it's me. It's David. Well, where is Emily? Shouts Catherine. It's all right. I just want to explain to you what is going on. You know, you're right. I never should have brought Emily up here. It was a mistake. Catherine still doesn't know she should trust David. So she starts shouting, Emily, Emily, where are you? And she's still pointing the gun. Towards David. David says, I mean, Emily is not the person who's not well. It's me. And as you said, trauma causes pain and you are right. Catherine tells him, don't worry, David, we're going to get you some help. And then David says, 
I'm sorry, before knocking the gun out of Catherine's hand and hitting her on the head. She falls over in the cave and she tries fighting back, but David begins to strangle her. Water is splashing everywhere and Catherine is fighting back as hard as she can, but all of a sudden, David pauses when he hears Emily shout, Dad! He gets up, turns around, and he points a flashlight to Emily. Emily is standing there sobbing and he says, There you are, in a cheerful tone. Don't, Emily says softly. Don't hurt her. Why? Why don't you want me to hurt her? Because she's my friend, cries Emily. David looks shocked. I thought I was your friend. Please, Charlie, please, please don't hurt her. But... Charlie starts to slowly approach Emily and he turns his flashlight on and off each time he takes a step closer to her. He turns on his flashlight again just as he's about to be right in front of Emily to kill her. But instead, when he turns the flashlight on, he sees Catherine standing there with her gun pointing at him. Hide and seek, she screams to Emily who's standing right beside her and Emily covers her eyes with her hands just like she used to when she would play hide and seek with Charlie. After this, Catherine shoots David and Emily screams. David falls into the water and Catherine goes to hug Emily and they're both crying. You're safe now, says Catherine. We see David's body just floating in the water along with Emily's dolls and along with the jewelry box that is still playing with the melody. Fast forward to Emily living in New York City again. She is drawing, and this time it's a happy photo of her and Catherine. She's in a new place now, and in the staircase behind her, Catherine comes down and says, It's time for school, sweetheart. Okay, replies Emily. So it seems like now Catherine and Emily are living together. Emily finishes up her drawing, Catherine grabs her purse and Emily's backpack. Have you got your homework? Yes, says Emily. Did you brush your teeth? Yes, replies Emily cheerfully. Great, says Catherine. And they walk towards the front door together and exit the house. However, Emily didn't take her drawing with her. She left it on the kitchen table. And when she added the finishing touches before leaving, it wasn't something nice like clouds or flowers or birds. She drew another head onto her body. So the question is, does Emily now have split personality disorder like her father? I don't know. What do you guys think? But all right, with that, that is hide and seek. I would love to know what you guys think about this down below. I really like this movie because it's really suspenseful. Like it's one of those like slow burning movies where it's not like a lot of action right away. There's nothing like too crazy happening in your face, but it slowly starts like building up. So the whole time you're just wondering like, who is Charlie? Like at first, I thought Charlie was a ghost. Like, I'm not gonna lie. I thought this was like a haunting movie or something like that. So I was like, okay, they moved into like this big old mansion. It's probably a ghost that's like controlling Emily or controlling David. I don't know. I thought it was something paranormal. But then like a little bit halfway throughout the movie, I was like, okay, I think it's the neighbor. Like he was a little bit creepy. He was like staring at Emily. So maybe he like befriended her and like made her do these things to kind of keep her to himself. And then when the wife was like, oh, you don't know how scary Steven can get. I was like, oh, okay. Like it's probably Steven. At no point did I think that Emily was the killer. I mean, that's just like not even possible because how would she have moved Elizabeth's body from downstairs all the way upstairs to the bathroom. So I never thought that like she was the killer. I just thought like someone was manipulating her and I don't know, at no point that I think it was David. Like that was like the last thing that I expected. So I really liked the twist in the movie and I don't know, I really liked it. It's definitely an oldie. I mean, it was made in 2005, so it looks a little bit old, but if you like Robert De Niro and you like Dakota Fanning, then you're definitely gonna like this movie. I swear Dakota Fanning is such a great actress. Like, I don't know how old she was in this movie, but like she was really little and the way that she acted is so good. Like I feel like she can get into a really dark headspace and like play those dark characters. So I don't know. She did an amazing job. I definitely think she needs to be in more psychological movies. So yeah, at no point did I think David was the killer or that David was Charlie. So I would definitely love to know what you guys think about this down below. There are a few alternate endings to the movie. One of the endings is David doesn't get shot and he ends up in a psychiatric institution and he ends up gaining back control of his mind and getting rid of Charlie once and for all. So it's clear that trauma and grief manifest in many different ways and you shouldn't ever really run from it like they did in the movie. You know, David thought that by moving away that would solve everything, but no. It's important to confront the grief and get help before it manifests and potentially turns into something violent and dangerous. 
dangerous to yourself and others. I will link a video with the other alternate endings down below because there's like three more, I think. They're all pretty creepy and kind of similar, but like very creepy. So I will have that link down below. I will say while I did really like this movie and I liked the acting and I liked everything, I do feel like there was like a lot of plot holes. Like I watched it the other day just to kind of refresh my mind and I was like, hmm, some things just don't make sense. Like for example, why were the neighbors pointing at his house and why did Steven want to see Emily so badly? I know that the directors of the movie used Steven to trick the audience and to trick David into thinking that he was Charlie, but I'm so confused about the conversation he had with Laura about how Steven gets angry. Like, were they fighting and pointing at the house because Laura was telling Steven to stay away from Emily? I mean, what was that conversation about, about Steven being bad? That part to me is a little bit confusing and why he was like, I wanna see Emily. Like, was it because he was worried about Emily's safety since David was like running outside with a shovel and with a knife? Or is it because he was like creepy and like wanted to see Emily for like another reason? Another thing was Elizabeth's car. Like the sheriff said that he found the car up the road Road, why wouldn't Elizabeth have parked in the driveway? That doesn't make sense to me. Did David move Elizabeth's car later to kind of add to the story? Or did Elizabeth park there and just walk up? Like that part didn't really make sense. Another thing is, why was Elizabeth so scared when she opened the closet? Like she was there playing hide and seek, thinking she was gonna find Charlie and she opens it to see David. So why would her immediate reaction be to like freak out and like fall backwards? Wouldn't she just be like, oh, David, like what are you doing here? Unless David like had a knife in his hand and like was like, that to her because we didn't see that part so I don't know I thought that part was a little bit confusing like why would she immediately scream if like she opens the door and sees her like I guess potential new boyfriend standing there you know another thing is why couldn't Emily just tell her dad the truth or tell someone I've seen some people say that maybe Charlie had threatened her and was like oh if you tell your dad that he's Charlie, like, I'll kill you, or if you tell someone I'll kill you or your dad. I don't know, maybe he did manipulate Emily, but it is a little bit confusing why she wouldn't just tell at least someone, like, hey, my dad has like another personality named Charlie and he's killing people. I will say that I do like how if you rewatch the movie now knowing that David is Charlie, you'll kind of see like little things and little hints indicating to the audience that David is Charlie this entire time. So for example, that one night when David went into Emily's bedroom and saw that the window was wide open, the same window that he couldn't open the other day, he's like, who opened the window? And Emily said, I thought you did, which was like a subtle hint to David and to the viewers that David was Charlie and that Charlie had opened the window earlier. So when she's like, I thought you did, she meant it literally. Another time is when David puts a tea kettle on the stove and walks away for like five seconds and then all of a sudden comes back and the tea and the water is boiling and falling all over the place. Well, he was confused because he just put the pot on the stove. So how is it already boiling? Well, thinking back, at it it's boiling because when David goes to put his headphones on and goes inside his office to like write in the journal and listen to his music he transforms into Charlie like time doesn't exist to him when he puts the headphones on and writes in his journal so that's why when he walked in, put his headphones on, and then later walked out, the water was already boiling because so much time had passed where he was acting as Charlie and playing hide and seek with Emily that water started to boil because that's how much time had passed. But in David's head, he didn't know that. Like he didn't know that he didn't even have his headphones on or that his book was like packed in a box. So just like subtle things like that, I really liked throughout the movie where you kind of just look back and you're like, oh, like now I can kind of see how David was Charlie all along. So I don't know, I think it's a really good movie. If you wanna see something suspenseful and just like spooky this Halloween season, I would definitely recommend you guys go check it out. I, where did I watch this? I think I watched this on Amazon or did I watch it on Hulu? I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure you can find it like anywhere. So yeah, that is hide and seek. Definitely let me know your thoughts on this down below. And I know this video is probably so long. So hopefully you guys got a snack or like ate some dinner or something while watching this. The brownies were honestly kind of a fail. I'm a little disappointed. They just don't look good. I think the only one that might look like a mummy and that's like a big mite is this one. I don't know why this is so hard you guys. Like this is my second time trying to make mummy brownies and they always turn out looking absolutely hideous. I mean they're still going to be good because like look at that. 
Look at how nice and like gooey and chocolatey that looks. Oh, it looks delicious. But there she is. There is the mummy brownie. <laughs> I mean, I guess it kind of looks like a mummy. Wait, there. It could kind of look like a mummy. I don't know. I'm still going to eat this either way. So let me know what you guys thought about this down below. And if there's ever any other spooky, scary movies or a book that you would want me to talk about, definitely let me know because I love making these videos. But I think that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you guys again so much for being here. And please stay tuned for the true crime video coming this week, as well as for a new episode of my podcast. Before we end the video, I feel like we just got to take a bite, okay? Let's take a bite of these mommy brownies. I'm going to go enjoy these brownies, go have some dinner, and I will see you all in the next video. Bye, guys.